Um, so good evening, everyone, and welcome to um, Downing College's Engineering Subject Admission Webinar. I'm Rosie, the School and College Liaison Officer for Downing College, and joining us today is Dr. Michael Crisp, who is the Director of Studies for Engineering at Downing College. Um, Dr. Michael Crisp is going to be talking to us a bit more about the engineering course, um, and then he'll hand over to Lucas, who is a current engineering student um, studying at Downing. Um, and at the end, we're going to have a Q&A session. So if you have any questions throughout um, any of the talks, then please do ask them using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen um, and uh, we'll answer any questions that you might have. So I'm just going to share my screen and then we will get started. Um, is that sharing? Yeah. OK, brilliant. Uh, but it's not full screen yet. Yeah. OK, is that working for everyone? Okay, brilliant. So um, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to uh, Michael. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Um, so just to introduce myself, I'm um, an engineering fellow at Downing and you know, obviously part of the engineering department. I'm primarily an electrical engineer, um, but we do have you know, fellows in other subjects. And the way that engineering is organized in the college is we have our four fellows and effectively each of us um, is DOS for a year that would sort of follow you through. So you know, I'm doing it this time, but um, you may well come across other people doing this kind of um, talk uh, at other times. So to give you a very quick overview of the course, I'm basically working on the assumption that you've probably seen the department website and you know, looked at it. So I'm hopefully not going to repeat too much of the information that's on there. Um, but you know, as you're almost certainly aware, we're a general engineering course. And what that means is that in the first two years of the course, what we call 1A and 1B, you study general engineering. So that broadly covers you know, civil engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, and information engineering, and then a good dose of maths that kind of covers all of those things. And you have very little choice about what you study in the first two years um, with the exception of you know, the easter term of the second year where you start to um, make some choices about what direction you want to go in in terms of an elective paper then in the third year everything changes so you go from having almost no choice to having a very wide choice and starting to specialize towards whatever sort of engineering that you want to do. So, you know, you start to focus more on the civils or more on the electrical or more on mechanical. And the, you know, there's a very, very wide choice. You need to do 10 out of about 45 modules. Um, there are some limits within that on, you know, how diverse you can be in your choices. And that's down to uh, what we call accreditation. So, you know, the Institute of Civil Engineers at the end of your course want to be able to say, yes, you are a civil engineer and you're exempt from doing certain exams. And so that places some limits on you know, how general you could be at that point. But, you know, most of the logical things that um, people want to do are possible. And, you know, if there's a combination that's not possible, it's normally only one or two modules that need to change. So that specialization sort of carries on into the fourth year where there's an even wider choice of modules. You will only really have to do eight of them. And I believe there's about 65 um, modules to pick from. And you also spend about 50% of your time um, doing a project in the fourth year. Um, there's also um, a separate manufacturing engineering tripos, which splits out in the third year. I've also highlighted on this slide that um, you need to do some industrial experience. Now, don't read too much into where I've put that. Um, the requirement is that you do um, eight, six weeks of industrial placements before you sit your exams in your third year. Um, but realistically, that means that the most you know, appropriate time for doing that is the summer holidays. So between first year and second year, or between second year and third year, or both. So if we can go to the next slide. So why do we want you to study general engineering if you're then going to um, specialize later? And particularly, you know, why study en general engineering 
when there's pretty much no such thing as a general engineer? Well, the idea is that, you know, when you go out as an engineer in the future, you'll be working as part of a team, no matter what you do. And, you know, the engineering challenges that we face today aren't, you know, purely civil or purely mechanical or purely electrical. So you will have to work with engineers from other um, specializations. And having that breadth of knowledge that the first two years gives you ought to allow you to at least be able to, you know, communicate in the right language with those engineers. And we find that, you know, this is very important and it's one of the things that's more unique um, about the course. It also gives you a huge benefit in that you've got the flexibility that you don't have to decide at the point of application exactly what sort of engineering it is you want to do until you've actually studied them for a couple of years and got a decent flavor of um, what they're about. And then of course, the, the third and the fourth years um, is focusing on specialization because you, know, you do need to get that depth of study in one specific field um, to be able to uh, compete um, with those students who have done you know, one specialization from the outset. So you know, what are we aiming to do with the course? Well, we want to train the very best engineers um, to solve the problems of the future. And you know, we really hope that you know, our general approach is a way of doing that. Um, the, the other thing that we sort of very, very much focus on is problem solving um, using what we call a first principles approach. And so what we mean by this is rather than understanding how to solve a particular problem that you may have seen before in a kind of a formulaic way, what we try to do is understand why a particular method works for a problem and give you a really you know, in-depth understanding of the basics, which could then be applied to any problem. Um, so you know, even within your specialization, you'll find that you know, in the future, you're going to come across problems that we haven't taught you about. Um, and it's the ability to apply this process of first principles, which sets apart um, the very best engineers. So if we go to the next slide, I've got a bit more concrete examples about you know, what a first principles approach is and you know, what you may have come across and how you could do it from first principles. So you know, I'm an electrical engineer, so I've got some resistor combinations there on the uh, left-hand side. So I'm sure that everyone here could tell me you know, what the formula is for a parallel combination of resistors and what the formula is for a series combination of resistors. Um, which is absolutely fine and is very, very useful if everything could be broken down into those two cases. But actually, I could come up with a circuit very, very easily where I add an extra voltage source in and I can't actually apply those formulas um, directly. But if you understand you know, what current is, what voltage is, and what Kirchhoff's laws are and how to apply them, I can both solve those two cases very quickly but I could also solve you know, any other problem that just contains you know, resistors, current sources, voltage sources. So it's a more flexible way of approaching the same problem. That's not saying that you know, knowing some derived results isn't useful in some cases where you've got um, you know, a fairly constrained problem um, and they can save you time, but it's by understanding the fundamentals that you get the flexibility to be able to cope with problems that you probably haven't seen before. On the right hand side, a more mechanical example. So Newton's second law is very, very often written as force equals mass times acceleration. And that's absolutely fine for you know, a frictionless block, which is what a lot of problems that you might come across might be. And the assumption that you're making there is that the mass is constant. But you know, what about a rocket? where actually the mass is varying over time, or if we want to work out what the thrust is from a jet engine, where actually it's a stream of um, mass that we're ejecting uh, out the back of the engine. And in that case, if you go to the other definition of Newton's second law, and you say that force is rate of change of momentum, then you can solve those other problems much more simply. And of course, if you take the assumption 
that the mass is constant, then you can derive forces mass times acceleration from that slightly more fundamental result. So if we go to the next slide. So uh, jumping around a little bit here, but as this is a, a college organized um, webinar, I thought I would say something about, you know, how the college and the department interface and you know what differences between colleges might be and how that relates to you know the, the four-year course so admissions is the first place where you'll you know interact with us and it, admissions are handled by the colleges as you probably are, are aware and it's the colleges that you apply to so it will be the colleges that um, perform the interviews although there is some you know interaction between colleges via the department in terms of you know the pools and um, all of that kind of uh, thing so then into the course everything becomes much more department heavy so in the first and second year the department organizes all of your lectures all of your labs the lecturers then set what we call examples papers so you know these are sets of questions that relate to your um lectures and a sort of the process of self-learning um and they form the basis of the supervisions so you will find that you get one supervision per examples paper but it's the college that organizes the supervisions based around your examples papers. So they select your supervisors and also you know, organize your supervision timetable. And then for exams, it's back to the department again. And that's basically the same in the first and second year. By the time you get to third year, um, because you're now selecting from such a wide range of courses, it becomes very difficult for anyone other than the module leader to select supervisors. So actually the department um, organizes your supervisions as well and you'll find that your supervisions are much more likely to be in the department buildings than in the college buildings um, and then into fourth year the supervisions are actually dropped and your main source of supervision is your project supervisor so the general message here is that actually you know the colleges aren't doing a great deal um, that will be different from college to college so you know from a college choice point of view my main message would be that you know, you ought to pick your college based on you know where you feel like you're going to fit in and be comfortable um in the knowledge that actually the interview process and admissions process will be very similar across colleges as will the supervision process and you'll come out with you know effectively the same degree and experience academically um irrespective of which college you go to so if we move on to the next slide. So I thought I would say something about admissions. So this possibly relates slightly more towards Downing than other colleges, but I think you'll find that my colleagues you know, elsewhere would say very, very similar things. So, you know, what are we looking for and what are our objectives in the admissions process? Well, we're trying to find the students that we think are going to make the best engineers. Um, I've said at the end of the fourth year, just because, you know, effectively what we're trying to do in this admissions process is predict the future, which is difficult and, you know, saying what will happen to you beyond four years is getting, you know, even harder than at four years. So what do we base our decisions on? Well, we've got interviews, we've got pre-interview assessments, um, grades, school references and personal statement. And without you know putting too much weight on things i would you know they're roughly in order of emphasis are there so you know the interviews are a very important part of the process the pre-interview assessment is very important then we're looking at you know contextual things everyone um is showing in the personal statement that they've got you know a massive enthusiasm for engineering so we tend not to have to worry about that so much um, in engineering so now we're getting to the point where there might be some differences between colleges and in downing we operate two subject interviews and basically the way that those interviews will work is each one will be with um two interviewers and we will ask some fairly hard maths and physics style problems 
So, you know, given we're going to ask you technical questions, why not just give you another pre-interview assessment and have you write the answers down? Well, we're actually trying to get something different out of the interviews than you know, can you or can't you answer a question? What we're looking for is you know indications of how you're going to respond over the four years of teaching that you'll get at Cambridge. And you know, that's the way that we try to you know, extrapolate from you know, pre-interview assessments and grades and score references, which tell you how you're doing now to sort of try and predict how you'll do in the future and how you know, the teaching process here might benefit you. So what we're looking at in you know, how you respond to those problems is you know, how you're thinking, um, are you thinking in a logical way? Are you, you know, going about things in a process that makes sense? Um, are you responding to hints that we're dropping? So sometimes we'll ask a question and that question might be to try and lead you in a particular direction and you know, how you respond to that. And then finally, you know, actually the problems that we set are quite abstract. But can you relate that back to the real world? Because you know, ultimately in engineering, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to solve real world problems. Yeah. Um, so just a few bits of advice on interviews, um, because this is probably my only opportunity to give it to you um, before interview. Um, I think thought it would be uh, a useful thing to do. So um there is a bit of uncertainty about interviews at the moment but it's almost certain that the interviews will be online this coming round so in terms of preparation you know the the best thing you could do is just try to talk someone through a problem on a team's whiteboard so you know take an a level question take a you know um one of your another pupil at your school or a teacher or a parent or you know anyone and just try to explain to them what it is that you're thinking and how you're going about um, solving that problem you know if you've got issues with um, you know technology and you know access to a stylus or whatever um, ask the college to help in advance because it's much much easier the more time we have to to deal with that if it's going to be a problem um, in terms of kind of preparation, it's useful to be familiar with you know, what you've been taught in school, but you know, what we'll be trying to do is see how you're gonna to respond to this kind of first principles approach. So try to really think about you know, what the fundamentals are that you're using rather than trying to you know, apply some kind of formulaic method, which happens to work for quite a lot of questions. So things like SUVAT, think about, you know, what's the minimum amount of knowledge I could actually use to solve one of those problems rather than just turning straight to um, a set of equations. And then in the interview, you know, what are the important things to do? So, you know, listening very carefully, both to, you know, what it is that we're asking you to do, but also, you know, if we do interrupt you or ask another question, or you know drop a hint we want to see how you respond to that so you know make sure that you do listen to what's going on um, rather than just plow on um, with a particular line of thought but if you think your line of thought is right argue your point because we might you know we're not going to necessarily say something is wrong outright we want to know why you're thinking what it is that you're thinking um the interviews are very compact. Um, so, you know, time's short, don't sit there for a long time, but do take time to think. Um, and, you know, if you need time to think, just say so. Um, link to the listening carefully. I would say don't try and draw out hints from your um, interviewers. So, what we want to see is how you're thinking independently. So, you know, if we think that you need a help, then we will give it. Um, or if we think that a question might lead you in a good direction, then we might ask it. But 
we want to see how far you can go on your own first. So you, know, you really need to do you know, as much thinking for yourself as you can. So you know, if you do get stuck or confused or something seems inconsistent in what you're doing, um, try explaining to us what it is that you're thinking. And that's more likely to lead on to something that's useful because what we're trying to do is see how well you're going to respond to this sort of supervision um, style of teaching which Cambridge is so reliant on. And you know, part of that is being able to articulate what it is that you're finding difficult or what step in you know, a certain process has got you um, stumped. So that was all I wanted to say. So I will now hand over to Lucas to give you more idea about what it's like to be a, an engineering student at Down. Hi, I'm Lucas. I'm a first year engineer, so I've done two terms and I'm about to head into my third term. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about why I applied to engineering and why I picked Downing. Next slide, please. Thank you. So I picked engineering because I really liked science and I really liked physics, but I also really wanted to see it applied in actual projects because I've done a lot of hobby projects before myself at home in electronics or just kind of testing things out, programming, for example. And in the course, you do labs and you do these sort of projects. You can see in the top left there, that's it's quite messy, but that's one of the short projects that we did recently. It was making a thermometer, which was entirely, entirely analog. So you press, you touch something and it lights different combinations of lights, depending how warm your finger is, for example. And I also really liked that you didn't have to specialize immediately because Cambridge is quite unusual for that, whereas most universities insist that you have to pick mechanical engineering, aeronautical engineering, when you haven't really studied any kind of engineering before. So you, you don't really know what any of those are, whether you'd fit in with that. So I found it was really helpful that I could start off with a general degree and hopefully specialize in something which I would like later. Uh, next slide, please. So just to give you an idea of what a week in my life is, this is kind of a sample week taken straight from my calendar in about February, I think, or March, I can't remember. But the blue, the blue blocks there are all uh, lectures, pretty much. And you can see that you have them, you have two or three a day, and they kind of end around lunchtime-ish. And those are all the whole year group in like a, in a large uh, lecture hall. And then I have about two or three supervisions a week or supos, which are small group sessions where it's just two of you and your supervisor going through the examples papers, which have been set by a lecturer. And you can see I kind of have two or three, and those are the green ones on the diagram. And then there's also like time for extracurricular things, which I put in purple, or just the college will organize social events which you can attend if you want. So for example, I'm part of the rock climbing club and that's, I put on Sunday in yellow there. And I found that even though the workload is quite high, there's loads of time to kind of have fun and do what you want, socialize or take part in other extracurricular activities. Next slide, please. So societies are one thing I've been asked to talk about. And essentially it's a group of people and you, do something which you all enjoy together. There's lots of different kinds, academic societies. So for example, at Downing, everyone, all the engineers get signed up for, I think it's called a Danby Society, which organizes, meets with other engineering societies around the uni. And also there's talks from uh, different famous engineers. And there's cultural societies. So I'm part of Abacus, which is a UK wide society for uh, British and Chinese students sports societies, drama, et cetera. And Downing is actually really good at drama and the arts. And I'll get into that a bit later. You can see me in the photo doing uh, a play, a very short play, which I did last time. And those societies, they're either tied to your college or they're tied to the uni as a whole. And it can be a really great way to interact with people at other colleges or just get to know people in your own college a bit better. Next slide, please. So the reason I picked Downing was 
partially, well, mostly, I guess, out of convenience. It has a lot of attributes I really like. So first, it is really near to the engineering department. It takes me about five minutes to walk there from my room. So I, I quite like to lie in, and that's really convenient for me. But also, it's really near to things like John Lewis or Sainsbury's or Tesco. So you just kind of have everything within 10, 15 minute walk at, at most. And also for me, since my main sport is rock climbing, it's really near both of the rock climbing gyms in Cambridge. On site, there's 24 hour library, a dining hall, which does lunch or brunch, dinner, as well as formals, which I'll talk about a bit later. Then there's a bar slash cafe because it, it, it during the day it's a cafe and in the evening it's a bar and typically, you go, I would go down there every so often, most evenings to uh, just chat in the bar. Then there's a gym and Downing is one of the few colleges which has a theater. And that's why it's quite big on the whole drama and art scene. It's also got an art gallery, which has had uh, Ai Weiwei and a few other famous artists in it. And there's quite a few other things which college has. It's, it's really nice because everything, in Downing is on site. There's no accommodation really far away like some colleges have. Everyone lives together and it's got a really nice community aspect. And on top of that, we have weekly college organized social events, which people go to and just kind of helps keep that community spirit. Uh, next slide, please. So I know when you're applying the whole atmosphere of Cambridge traditions and it being a bit stuffy it can be a bit of a push off. So I'd just like to go over a few of those, but the main thing is, is that you don't have to take part in any of these if you don't want to, if you think it's too pretentious. So the first thing is college families, which are essentially a glorified buddy system. So when you first join your college, you're partnered up with one or two other people in your year group, and also with some people from the year group above you. And those are your college parents and they show you around and you can just keep in contact with them if you have anything you want to talk about or if you need pointers about subject because they're, they've just done the year in your subject which you are now coming into, or if you need to find something or there's lots of, it's just a really good support system and it helps keep the college community really close together. And then formals are essentially a cheap-ish three-course meal in the dining hall. And I put a picture of one which I attended last term on screen. And that's around £10, which is very good for a three-course meal. And you would go with your friends and, you can, and it's just a really nice way to have a meal together for relatively cheap. And then finally, May balls are something which you might have heard about. Newspapers quite like to do coverage on them. They're big parties at the end of the year. I haven't been to one myself because I'm a first year and it hasn't been the end of the academic year yet. But I'm on the committee planning this year's one and we're going to have about 2.5 thousand people. So it's a big event and Downing typically has one of the best Mabels. Uh, next slide, if this the next slide. Oh yeah, so some advice. I was quite nervous when I applied and I didn't really know what I was doing much like most of you because you haven't been through this through the system before and the information online isn't always helpful it can be quite conflicting sometimes so firstly i didn't know how to write a personal statement and i never written anything like it before so i didn't really know what to do i found it quite hard to start writing but one advice which my sick form tutor at the time gave me was to start kind of in the middle which is what the body of it when you know what you have to kind of have to say you talk about what you've number four and how, how you enjoy your subject, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can do the end and then the start, which kind of helps you keep it concise and keep the flow. And I was also really scared of those crazy, quirky interview questions you always hear about. And in a sense, I, in my own experience, I over-prepared for those sort of questions. So by the time of the interview, I was really good at random, quirky interview questions, but not so good at what I was actually asked, which was just hard, essentially A-level questions. I also wouldn't stress about knowing content which you haven't been taught yet. You're not gonna be expected to learn 
uh, to, to know content which hasn't come up in your course yet. And also, even if you if a question could be helped by content which you haven't covered yet, as was in my case, as long as you just say your thought process and you keep working through it, you're communicating what you're thinking and it's kind of your thought process that matters more than the content, than knowing lots of facts, if that makes sense. And finally, I came out of both of my interviews thinking that I had flopped both of them, but clearly that, that wasn't the case. I think when you come out of an interview, whether you think it's good or gone badly, you don't really know. You're not a good judge of your own performance, so I wouldn't stress about that after the interview too much. Also, you can't change anything at that point. Oh, and one final thing. As Michael was saying just now, the interview times are very, very short, and that's something which really shocked me because I was expecting a longer time to work through the questions when in reality you have to, you shouldn't rush them, but you shouldn't take ages and just say, uh, I don't know what to do. You should keep working, keep trying new things if you're stuck. And if you're really stuck, they will provide guidance or say, maybe you could try this, et cetera, stuff, things like that. And I think that's everything in this slide. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Lucas, for sharing your um, perspective um, as a current engineering student. We're now going to go on to the question and answer section um, of this webinar. So if you have any questions um, for either Dr. Michael Crisp or Lucas, um, then pop them in the Q&A feature, um, which should be at the bottom of your screen. Um, we've had a couple of questions already. Um, so there's a couple about the course in general. Um, Michael, so there's a question that is asking, how would you describe the differences um, between Cambridge students taking engineering and other subjects such as physical natural sciences? You know, what makes them very different subjects? So, well, the difference between um, engineering and natural sciences, I think, is that natural sciences, it's much more about the subject for its own sake so you know basically wanting to understand the world around us purely for curiosity whereas engineering is taking that science and trying to apply it to make the world better brilliant thank you um and related to this um we've had a question about what are the opportunities for studying um, additional modules from non-engineering departments you're interested in? Is there any um, kind of branching out that's possible? Um, so as a formal part of the course, um, not much. In third year, you know, there are some modules that are shared with, say, computer science on robotics um, and also some sort of bioengineering modules that kind of cross disciplines. Um, but you know, formally, particularly within the first two years of the course, there's not actually much scope for doing it. But one right of all students is to be able to attend lectures in any department. So you know, if it fits in the timetable and it really fits your curiosity and you've got time for it, then you know, there's nothing to stop you going and um, learning that in your own time. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and then we've had a couple of more admissions-related questions. Um, so the first one is, how important is further maths for Cambridge? Um, this individual wants to complete the A-level, but is worried that uh, continuing with it um, will disadvantage that other subject. So is it more important to have further maths or um, to make sure you have strong A-levels in the three subjects that you are doing? Um, so I would say that you know, it's very important. Um, so, you know, I think the thing that surprises everyone about engineering is how mathematical it is, because actually what you're learning in sort of pure further maths is very applicable in all sorts of fields of engineering. So you, one way of looking at engineering is it's, you know, the maths of civil engineering and the maths of electrical engineering and so on. Um, in terms of, you know, importance, some colleges do require further maths. We don't. Um, but if you don't do further maths, we'd want there to be a pretty good reason for it. Um, so, you know, for example, if your school doesn't offer further maths, then you know, clearly that 
makes studying further maths pretty much impossible. If your school um, does offer it, then you know, I, I would really expect it to be done. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and another student who is sitting their A-level maths in year 12, and then in year 13 sitting further maths, physics and computer science. Um, if they get um, A star, A star, A offer, does the maths A-level from year 12 count as one of those grades? Um, pass, I would have to ask the admission student to that one. <laughs> um, in general, um, the advice in terms of sitting A-levels in different years, um, so it's absolutely worth getting in contact with the admissions tutor for our kind of hard line from them. But in general, um, the advice is that we like you to sit your A-levels all in the same year um, because that demonstrates that you can kind of manage the workload of those A-levels. Um, so it's a really good indication that you'll be able to manage the workload at Cambridge University. Um, but because you'd be sitting three whole A-levels in um, year 13, so you're still completing your three A-levels, you're just doing one a little bit before, um, it might be a bit different. So it's definitely worth sending an email to um, the admissions officer um, to get a hard answer for that. Um, another question we've got um, is about, um, does studying um, a diploma in ed engineering um, kind of put you at an advantage um, in your application? Um, I don't, it's certainly not a bad thing to do, um, but you know, it's, we recognize that a lot of schools don't offer, you know, an engineering course. So, you know, the I think the, the expected courses are maths, further maths, physics, and, you know, what you do besides those, um, we'd expect it to probably be roughly aligned with engineering, but, you know, you could do a language, um, so I think, you know, the short answer is, you know, if, if you've got the opportunity to do an engineering course and it interests you, do it. But um, I wouldn't have said it's a particular advantage or disadvantage. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, we have a question about um, work experience and whether there's an expectation for them to have completed work experience before applying. Um, no, not at all. I mean, we realise that it's difficult to get work experience. I mean, obviously, everyone does work experience at 16. Um, but, you know, there's no expectation that you will have managed to secure a placement um, in engineering um, before applying. Um, you know, that would be a big ask. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and then we've had a few questions about personal statements. Um, so somebody's asked, uh, what is the most important deciding factor in an applicant's personal statement, whether or not you would consider them? Um, I would have said that above the, well, so what I'm looking for in a personal statement is whether there's enough enthusiasm for the subject, um, that, you know, it's a sensible choice to study it. Um, and that's all, um, the decision about, you know, whether we go to interview or not is much more based on, you know, references, um, GCSE grades and the um, admissions test. Um, so how important are GCSE grades um, for engineering at Cambridge? Um, <laughs> so, well, you know, they're one of the metrics that we can look at. Um, I don't think I can say more than that. Um, you know, we would expect good grades for your school. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Lucas, um, we've had somebody ask um, whether you can give any examples of supercurricular activities you did prior to applying to Cambridge that you included in your personal statement um, and maybe spoke about our interview. Uh, sure, I didn't speak about any supercurricular stuff at interview because I wasn't asked anything on that. But in my personal statement, there was a book I saw recommended somewhere called, I think it was Professor Povey's book of puzzles or something along those lines by an Oxford professor called Professor Povey. And it's just a book of physics and math puzzles on a bunch of different topics, not all of which are necessarily relevant because, um, how do we say this? Because some of them cover content which you don't learn at A-level. 
So I just picked and chose from that book and I found it was really helpful because some of the problems in there are really kind of tricky, but not, not necessarily like out of reach, if that makes sense. And they're all kind of graded with like a star system. And then apart from that, I, there was a reading list online from the department, I think for either prospective applicants or people coming into first year. And I found that online, I picked a, a few books from that and read those and mentioned that in my personal statement. And then I did a math modeling competition, I think called the M3C challenge. It's, if you Google that, it'll come up online. And I think those are kind of the main things which I spoke about in my personal statement. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and on that topic, um, is there any kind of advice or recommendation about kind of how much supercurricular um, activities should um, a student do um, and include in their personal statement? Is that for me? Sorry, yes, I think you're probably yeah, the best um, person to answer so, that. I mean, I think what we're looking for is that, you know, we want to see that you, you know, you've got a real enthusiasm for the subject because there will be parts of it that you might find less interesting than others. And we want, you know, we want to know that you're going to be able to stick it through those. Um, I think having some evidence of, you know, being able to do stuff outside of your A-levels is a really good thing to, to show because, you know, the, you know, the intensity of the course here is significantly more than A-levels. So, you know, it, just like, you know, showing that you can do, you know, manage the workload of three or four A-levels in one year, you know, having some extracurricular activities alongside that, I think shows it, you know, even more strongly. Um, but there, it would raise alarm bells at the other extreme if we thought that you were just going to spend your entire life here, um, you know, going between all of the different societies and never actually getting down to do some work. So there is a balance. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and we've had a question about the My Cambridge application. So for those of you who don't know, um, once you've submitted your UCAS application, which is due on the 16th of October this year, um, while you're sending off your personal statement to all five universities that you want to apply to. Um, you'll then get an additional application to fill out specifically for Cambridge called the My Cambridge application. Um, and this will include um, as asking you for a little bit more information about uh, the particular curriculum that you're studying in your um, A-level subjects. There's also a space for um, any extenuating circumstances you may have encountered um, that have caused educational disadvantage. Um, and there's an option for an additional personal statement if the course that you're applying to at Cambridge is different to the course that you're applying to across all other universities, because we're aware that, um, you know, some of our courses are very kind of unique, um, and so it might not be applicable to all of your courses. So the first question that we've had um, is, if um, you're applying to a specialised engineering course at other universities, is it recommended to do an additional personal statement um, within the My Cambridge application uh, for your um, like Cambridge um, admission um, or is it okay to kind of be talking mainly about one type of engineering in your personal statement? No, I think it's absolutely fine to talk about, you know, one sort of engineering in your personal statement. Um, I don't see the need for a, an additional one. Um, the only caveat I'd add to that is that, you know, other universities may like to see that you do have a bit of interest you know outside of that narrow area um just so you know so that you come out with this ability to interact with engineers in other fields brilliant thank you um and um, we've also been asked whether in the extenuating circumstance option um is it appropriate or worthwhile to mention that the school doesn't offer any support or coaching for the engineering entrance exam um yes no harm putting it in there Brilliant. Yes, in general, if there's anything, you know, if you're in doubt about whether it's worthwhile to include or not, just include it, um, because then we have that information to help contextualise your application. Um, what about um, preparing for the uh, pre-admission assessment? Um, kind of probably from both of you, uh, what is your best advice and how to prepare for that um, pre-admission assessment? So, um, having never done it myself, um, it's a difficult one to answer, but, you know, I would, I would guess, you know, looking at past papers, um, you know, nothing 
really beats doing the questions. Yeah, I just spent, I think it was the whole, my, for me, it was after the half term. So I spent the whole half term just doing past papers. And when I ran out, I think I did some of the physics nasty ones as well, uh, but just past papers really, I think. Brilliant. And how did you find the admission process in general, Lucas? Mm, I think I was, I didn't think, I quite strongly felt I wouldn't get a place because my, uh, the ENGAR or whatever it's called now, the admissions test didn't go very well for me. And I had like a slight panic attack in the middle of it. And then also I didn't think the interviews went well either, but I think you're not a good, good judge of your own performance necessarily. So it's quite hard to tell how well you've done until you receive the results back, really. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and we've had some more general questions about, um, is there anything you'd recommend prospective students to do um, to prepare for Cambridge Engineering? So not necessarily, um, you know, make guarantee that you get the offer, but if you get the offer, is there anything you'd recommend um, to make sure that you're prepared for starting it? Um, I think we'll take, send that to you, Michael. Um, well, firstly, make sure you get the grades. Um, and you know, then we actually send out some materials in the summer holidays before you first arrive. So you know, you'll get some, um, you know, there's a website called um, Newton Physics where we you know, ask all of the incoming first years to you know, basically just do a bit of revision, make sure their maths is still you know, at the level it was. Um, when they were sitting their A levels before they um, come here and kick off. So, you know, beyond that, I don't think there's anything in particular. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and I guess kind of related to that, Lucas, when you started your course, did you feel kind of prepared um, and like it was new content um, and maybe challenging, but that you could do it? Uh, I think I felt completely prepared. And I think for the first, at least most of the first term, it was just recap for me from A level. A big part of that which helped was that I did further maths and a lot of the maths content was just going over the final points, which help in later sections of the course, I think. But I know a lot of my friends who, some of them who didn't do further maths, they did have to do some catch up on, on that side of things, for example. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and we've had some questions about kind of super curriculars in general and some students struggling to know where to start in trying to find super curriculars or figure out how to kind of widen their knowledge and understanding of the subjects that they kind of areas that they are interested in. Um, do either of you two have any advice of where's a good place to start um, to begin kind of finding out more and learning more? Um, well, I mean, I would have thought, you know, if you've got an interest in engineering, and you know you go into a bookshop there's actually quite a lot of you know popular science oriented engineering books um and i'm sure there would be something that would be interesting um the thing i wouldn't do is sort of go for some sort of hardcore thermodynamics straight out um particularly as i'm an electrical engineer um you know keep it Keep it something that's you know genuinely your interest. I think. Brilliant, thank you. What about you, Lucas? Um, how did you start finding your super curriculars? Uh, I kind of paid close attention to see if there were any relevant like competitions I could do, but also I found there was a reading list online. I think I might have mentioned before, and it's got maybe ten or twelve books that the department recommends for people coming into the course. And I picked, yeah, I didn't, similar to what Michael said, I didn't pick the ones which are hardcore structural design or something. I picked, I think both of the ones I picked and mentioned in my personal statement were written by journalists. So they were made for kind of a wide audience. One of them was like a history of British engineering and the others, the other was like, I think it was uh, how you, engineers can take inspiration from nature when designing things, which are kind of both accessible and interesting. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and Lucas, we've also had a question about um, what should students consider when choosing amongst colleges? So I know that you spoke a bit about why you chose Downing College, but what sort of things were you thinking about when you were deciding on your college more generally? For me, the main thing was 
convenience and proximity to the things which I was interested in. But other things you could consider are, I mean, I think a large part of picking a college is just whether you like the vibe of it. So if you have a chance to visit the college, that's a really good way to get a feel for it. But, uh, but also, I mean, I know some people like to go to Trinity because they hear it's very prestigious or people have, a lot of my friends pick the same college which their siblings or parents went to. But apart from that, for me, the main thing was just convenience and proximity to things which I liked. Brilliant, thank you. Um, some of the other things that people think about as well are things like cohort size. So there'll be a different number of engineering students. Um, there'll be a different number of places at every college. Um, now, this doesn't impact your chances of getting in at all, which is a common misconception. A lot of people think that if you apply to a college which has um, more spaces for engineering, you're more likely to get a place. Um, but because we have a pooling system, which the um, YouTube video that Downing College's admission tutor has recorded explaining the admission process in detail will explain to you if you don't um, already know about it. So if you've got any questions about how any of that works, um, I'd advise you to go and watch that. But it's essentially a system that's put in place to make sure that if you are a competitive application who deserves a place at Cambridge, um, it doesn't matter which college you've applied to because we'll find you a space at Cambridge. Um, it might not be in the college that you applied directly to, but we will still find you a space. Um, so a lot of people uh, consider how many kind of engineering students they'd like around them at their supervisions and in their small community. Um, so that's one of the things people think about. Um, also, it's all kind of about what they look like because they're all built at different time periods. Um, they're all kind of different um, like amounts of years old. I'm sure there's a better way of saying that phrase. Um, and, um, you know, some colleges offer accommodation on site for three years and some accommodate some colleges offer accommodation off site for some of the years. Um, so it's all kind of things like that, but it's incredibly individual. The reason that you'll choose the college that you end up choosing. And there's not necessarily a logical way of doing it. Um, like a lot of the time you ask people why they chose their college and it is things like, you know, the accommodation or the location. No one's got like a, a solid, like, you know, there's not an academic reason to pick any college. It is just where do you want to live for the next three years? Uh, oh, we've been asked about um, kind of college, um, what's the best way of putting this, stereotypes, Lucas. So someone said, is there a general down in college student personality? Um, but in general, this question's best to consider kind of um, colleges themselves. Is there a typical kind of college stereotype or is it pretty mixed? I mean, I think there are stereotypes about downing, but in terms of what I've actually experienced, it's very mixed. You can find all sorts of people and one thing is because we live all on site, is the community is really tight knit and you get to know everyone really well. There's about 130 of us, I think, in our year group ish. Um, and I know everyone pretty, pretty well, I think. Yeah, I would agree with that, that when you're thinking about factors, consider which college you want to, kind of any um, preconceptions that you have of colleges or you've already heard are probably the least useful thing to consider because most of them are entirely inaccurate and um, you know, you might miss out on the right college for you because of something that won't actually be the case. Um, so definitely kind of think about um, what's important to you in a college. Um, I think unless, oh, we've had another question through, um, we're going to take a few final questions now. So um, if you've got anything else to ask, and this is your kind of final chance. Um, Lucas and Michael, we've been asked whether there are any websites you'd, you would advise to visit to find these kinds of uh, mathematical or engineering competitions that they can take part in. I, I don't know. I'm going to be honest. I don't know where I found the ones which I did. Uh, I think my school had like a newsletter every month or so where it would put out some, some things you might like to take part in. And that's how I found out about them. Or one way is if your school does have internal competitions, that's kind of equally good as take part of some international thing, really. Yeah, I mean, I would say it very much doesn't matter, you know, exactly what it is that you do. It, it's just a matter of doing something. So, you know, whatever you can find by a quick Google um, it is probably going to be the most effective way. And you know, it, what matters most, I expect, is 
it really aligning with what's interesting to you rather than um, being the most prestigious you know, international competition and that sort of thing. Um, well, thank you. Um... Okay, the last question then um, is again about finding resources um, to kind of boost your kind of knowledge and understanding of engineering. Um, and it's asking, are there any kind of taster lectures or seminars or events um, that can be attended at Cambridge to broaden knowledge? Um, I'm happy to answer this one. Um, every college kind of runs their own um, support for these kinds of things. So lots of colleges will run like master classes or taster sessions or even things like residentials, um, which you know you can apply to join. Um, so if you want to have a look at what is offered from by Cambridge, um, then if you go on to um, the kind of central Cambridge page and if you type in events listing, it'll come up with a series of events that all colleges are offering. Um, all of these are events are free. Um, so have a look to about what you can sign up to that might kind of help um, boost your knowledge um, and help you figure out kind of where to go. Um, okay, well, I think that's all of our questions. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, and thank you to Dr. Michael Crisp and to Lucas um, for your talks. Um, I hope everyone has a lovely evening.